from there, we're going to turn it over to our beautiful speaker, Katie Davis. Awesome. All right, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, thank you all for making it out amid the snow and the slush. It's a particularly unpleasant day here in New York, um, but I'll try to make it worth your while. Today, I'm going to talk through a quick introduction to behavioral science. Um, talk about what Ideas42 is, why I'm here talking to you today. Um, talk about The Nudge. Some of you may have read the book Nudge by Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler, which talks about this behavioral design concept. Um, and then we'll talk about some deeper solutions that move beyond the nudge. All right, so this is one of my favorite depictions of human beings. These gentlemen have made it farther than I make most mornings on their way to the gym. They're in their clothes, they've got their towels, they've made it all the way to the gym, and yet at the last second they somehow end up taking the escalator as opposed to the stairs. Um, I think this perfectly encapsulates something about humans, which is that we are quirky, we make unexpected decisions, and oftentimes even when we have good intentions and strong intentions, they can be very easily interrupted by elements of our context, like where a staircase is placed relative to an escalator. Um, as designers, that's good news because it means that the how we place an escalator relative to stairs can actually influence our behavior. It means that as designers, we play an important role in the way we design things. I'm going to give you guys a quick quiz. Does everyone have pen and paper available? All right, I'm going to ask you a series of questions and ask you to write down your answer fairly quickly. I'm not going to give you a lot of time, so just jot down your first answer. All right, a cup and a co saucer cost $1.10 in total. The cup costs a dollar more than the saucer. How much does the saucer cost? Write down your answer. All right, moving right along told you it was going to be fast. If it takes five machines, five minutes, to make five widgets, how long does it take a hundred machines to make a hundred widgets? Write down your answer. Third and final question. In a pond, there is a patch of lily pads. Every day, the patch doubles in size. If it takes 48 days for the patch to cover the entire pond, how long will it take for the patch to cover half the pond? Write down your answer. All right. All right, we'll come back to your answers later. I'll hold you in suspense for a few minutes. Um, now I'm going to give you a quick puzzle to think through. Here I've shown you a solid block of wood with a pencil inside it. I'm showing it to you from two different directions, so you can see that there's not secret holes in the back where we <laughs> stuck the pencil inside. My question for you is, how did that pencil get inside that block of wood? Any guesses? No, sorry? <laughs> <laughs> nope. Good guess. It's not one long pencil. It's, n it's not one long pencil. It is a long pencil, but it's stuck inside that block of wood. Oh, it was not carved in there. Good guess. And it wasn't magic. It's not real wood. Oh, it's real wood. It's real wood. <laughs> 3D printer. 3D printer? Nope. Also a good guess. What if I show you this picture? Does that change your answer at all? No. <laughs> <laughs> Say that again? Uh, the wood is not a sponge, <laughs> but in some way it's like a sponge. Aha. When is it flexible? When it's wet. Aha. So, <laughs> people who do woodworking might already know this, but when you take wood and steam it and get it up to a high temperature, it becomes flexible. So you could steam the wood, bend it, slip the pencil in, bend it back. So the reason I show you this is not to trick you, um, but instead to talk about how our mental models, the way we conceptualize how things work in the world, helps determine the type of solutions that we generate. 
When I showed you the sponge, you generated a very different set of answers than when you were thinking of wood as being a hard, malleable substance. So by showing you the sponge, I was trying to get you to think about wood in a different frame, thinking of wood being more like a sponge where if you add moisture and heat, it becomes flexible. So just as we have mental representations of what wood is and how it operates in the world, we also have mental representations of human beings. We might think sometimes that humans are like Spock, that we are perfectly rational, that we are like an android. We consider the costs and benefits of any decision, we weigh them carefully, and then we follow through on our intentions. This is the economic viewpoint of the world, of the rational actor. Other times it might be tempting to think of humans on the other end of the spectrum, where they're more like Homer Simpson. They're short-sighted, they're impulsive, they make funny decisions. Sometimes they just go for the donut, they're not thinking about the long term. Uh, at Ideas42, we think neither of these viewpoints is completely correct. We think people are more somewhere in the middle. Uh, I personally think that people are like Elaine Bennis from Seinfeld, those of you who are Seinfeld fans. Um, she's quirky, she's a fairly sharp person, and yet see, she sometimes makes odd decisions. If any of you have seen the episode where she dances <laughs> at a wedding, you may wonder, what makes humans do these quirky things, <laughs> right? And the way we think about humans, whether we think of them as being like Spock, like Homer, or like Elaine, changes the way we design things for humans and the way we expect them to interact with their environments. I'm going to share a quick story with you. Um, this is a story about the B-17 bomber, which was developed in the 1930s. It was also called the Flying Fortress, state-of-the-art aircraft uh, developed by Boeing. They were very excited um, about rolling out this plane in the military. They had some of the best pilots in the world who were flying these planes. So they were very puzzled when they started doing test runs with the planes that the pilots continually crashed the plane at landing. They thought, well, maybe this is a training problem. So they retrained the pilots. Um, they even started a motivational campaign called Excellent Airmen Commit No Errors to convince the pilots not to crash the plane. Um, and yet, neither of those things worked. What they ended up doing was hiring a psychologist named Alphonse Chaponis, and they brought him in to sit with pilots as they were landing the plane and observe what was actually going on. Um, what Chaponis discovered is that there was an interesting design feature within the cockpit of the plane. Um, it's a bit hard to see, but some of these levers in the back, he found that there were two levers that were identical and next to each other. One of them controlled the landing gear of the plane. Another one controlled the flaps of the plane to slow it down. And at landing time, the pilots were confusing the two levers. And when they meant to retract the landing gear, they accidentally used the flaps of the plane and vice versa. So what he discovered is that it actually wasn't something about the pilots themselves at all. It wasn't about the person. It was a design feature of the cockpit. Um, and it's often these situational factors um, that end up influencing our behavior more than the underlying person themselves. Um, he created a new system of shape coding that's actually still used in cockpits today, um, where one of the knobs is indicated with a, a round circle so they can feel that that's the control for the landing gears, and the other one is marked with a triangle. So without looking over, the pilots can easily distinguish between the two controls. And this is something we find broadly about humans. Um, if I asked you, what percentage of your behavior do you think is a result of your innate personality or your innate characteristics? What percentage would you say? Any guesses? 10%. 10%? Okay. Any other guesses? 30%. 30%? Okay. What percentage do you think is determined by the factors around you, the, the situation, the context that you're in? Over 50. Over 50? Yeah. So in reality, um, it's hard to boil down to distinct figures. Um, but one of our founders, who's a psychologist, says roughly 70% of our behavior is determined by the context around us, and only 30% is due to who we are as people, what our innate pers personality characteristics are. 
Again, good news for designers, um, but it means that we actually play a really important role in how we shape behavior. All right, I know you've all been dying to find out the answers to that quiz that I gave you. Um, a cup and a saucer cost a dollar ten in total. The cup costs a dollar more than a saucer. How much does the saucer cost? The correct answer is five cents. Anybody get five cents? All right. Uh, five machines, five minutes to make five widgets. A hundred machines to make a hundred widgets. This is a classic rate problem. Um, it's not a hundred minutes. It's five minutes. Anybody get that one right? All right. Excellent. Um, and the last problem was a classic half-life problem um, for you math fans out there. Uh, it's not 24 days, it's 47 days. Um, and I think if I gave you guys enough time, all of you would have gotten these correct answers eventually. Um, but I purposefully didn't. I made you think about it very quickly um, because I wanted to illustrate something about the brain. These, I think, are the more interesting answers. Do these look familiar to anybody? Yeah. So these are the classic answers that people give to these questions. Um, and it's, it's about this, something that the brain does, which is operates in two different systems. So some of you may have read the book Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. It's a great behavioral economics read. He talks about these two modes of thinking. One is called system one. That's what you use to generate these interesting answers when you're not thinking about something deeply or deliberatively. It's called automatic or reflexive thinking. Um, and it's how we go about our day most of the time. We don't engage in deep thought about every decision we need to make. And that's because we would be paralyzed by decision if we thought about every single facet of our lives in that depth. So we naturally use this system one, this automatic thinking, to get through the day. System two is what generates these correct answers, and it requires more cognitive effort. It means we engage our brain more deeply, um, but it also takes a toll on our mental bandwidth because it requires us to engage. <coughs> so I made you do this exercise because I wanted all of us to see that this is something not about other people. This is about ourselves and how our brain actually works. Um, it's for good reasons. I don't like the terms rational and irrational. Um, because I think the human brain operates the way it does for very good reasons. Um, it's just not always the way that we would anticipate. So the more we can understand about neuroscience and the way the brain works, the better we can design for humans as they really are, rather than how we would like them to be or how we think they might be. So the standard model of decision making, if I tried to break down someone's process of decision making, um, I might come up with something like this. I'm going to weigh the benefits and the costs. If the benefits outweigh the costs, I'll decide yes. I'll follow through to take an action related to that decision, and then you'll see a positive outcome. If I decide no, I will follow through with the required action or not take an action. Then you'll see a negative outcome. Um, so this is the Spock model of the world, right? This is economic. Um, this is the rational actor calculating. It's tempting sometimes to think that the actual model um, is pretty messy. Once you start looking at the behavioral literature, there are so many instances of where we depart from that rational model um, that it starts to feel like it's all just a mess and it's impossible to predict how humans behave. Um, but in reality, we can predict. This is where behavioral science um, becomes really important to help us understand what are the ways that people are likely to behave in this context, given what we know about humans. Um, for instance, we know that there are a lot of different factors that affect our decision making. We might decide yes, we might decide no, or we might fail to choose at all. We might defer that decision to another day or avoid making that decision. When we get to that action stage, we might follow through based on what we decided, or we might not. The process of taking an action might actually change our decision. We might say, I don't want to fill out this form after all. I don't want to do this. Um, and then you see the outcomes at the end don't necessarily correspond with the decisions I made. Um, you might see no action, but it turns out I did decide yes. I just didn't follow through on that decision. Or maybe 
you see no outcome there because I failed to decide at all. I never actually made a decision. Um, so all of this to say, we can make some predictions about how people behave. Um, and that's where really rigorous experimentation um, becomes an important companion to design to see if what we designed is actually effective or not. Um, and as behavioral designers, it's this interplay between the context that people live in and the psychologies. Um, and how, how does that context actually shape my behavior that allows us to design effective solutions? Um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about our work in economic mobility, in particular in helping people save money. And uh, what we find here is what we see among human behaviors and decision making tells us something about the condition of poverty. What does it mean to live in a context of poverty? Um, and how does that tell us um, something important that we can design around, as opposed to attributing it to the character of the people experience it? It's actually great news for economic mobility, because it means we don't have to change the people. We just need to change the context around people. All right, so what is Ideas42? Why am I here talking about this to you? Um, we are a nonprofit behavioral design lab. Um, we use insights from behavioral science. That includes psychology, social psychology, cognitive science, behavioral economics. Um, and we use those insights to design solutions to solve these sort of sticky social problems where traditional solutions have not been effective. Um, where did Ideas42 come from? We started as an academic research lab at Harvard. Um, we were literally housed within Harvard. We produced papers and journal articles that fed into the academic world. Um, but our three founders, who were two behavioral economists and a psychologist, wanted to do more that reached the real world and didn't stay within academia. So they spun us off into a nonprofit in 2008 um, to tackle social problems with behavioral science and partner with other organizations who are working in the field. Now we've grown from three people to over 85 people um, working across um, multiple domains around the world, not just in the US. My own journey, um, thank you for the kind introduction. You've already heard a little bit about my background. Um, I started off as a math major with a love for data and statistics. Um, I joined the Peace Corps to do good in the world. Um, I ended up learning a lot about economic opportunity and how both the private and public sectors can work together um, to promote economic opportunity which got me interested in finance. So I took a little bit of a detour there um, and worked in financial markets, um, looking at uh, large shareholders like pension funds and how they protect their investments. And then I went back to grad school um, and fell in love with behavioral economics while I was there. Because to me, it really underpins all economic development work in thinking about what are the assumptions about what we think people want and need in their lives. Um, Luckily, it includes all of my favorite components of data, uh, social good, and a little bit of finance. So we maintain uh, ties with our academics through our advisory board, um, who help set the strategic direction of our organization. But we also pull in those academic affiliates on specific projects. Um, say someone specializes in um, theory about how people save money, we'll bring them in on a savings project and consult them to get their expertise. We also have a wider network of academic affiliates that we bring in to give talks and lectures. But most of our staff are actually practitioners who have worked in the field implementing real world projects, whether that's in the nonprofit world or the private sector. And the way we work is typically we're funded by major foundations like the Ford Foundation, the Gates Foundation. We'll partner with another nonprofit or a government agency or sometimes with a private sector firm when we think there's social good uh, to be done. And as I mentioned, we work across domains. Economic mobility has really been at our core since the very beginning. Um, but we've branched out a lot into education, health, international development. Um, we've ramped up our government work, our criminal justice work as well. And we're based around 60% in the US, 40% internationally. Um, and the project today I'm going to talk to you about um, was one we did in the Philippines. 
All right, so what do we do as a behavioral design firm? We're somewhere in between the research world, the design world, and the consulting world. And what we do is we try to investigate problems and use a scientific method to design around them. So first we go in and try to carefully define what is the problem that we're trying to solve to begin with. Can we strip away assumptions that we're bringing about what that problem is and how we might solve it? Um, we try to diagnose what the underlying factors are. So this is a lot of qualitative research in terms of interviews, observations, focus groups, looking at the underlying data and trying to develop hypotheses around what do we think is going on with humans behave, human behavior in this context. Um, we'll use that diagnosis to design something we think is effective. Um, we'll do prototyping and user testing to test it out um, before we launch it. And then we'll run a full randomized control trial, which for those of you who are familiar with experiments, um, is a way to rigorously test the impact of a design. And then finally, we try to scale by sharing whatever we learned with the field and hopefully sharing it with other practitioners who can implement what we found. Uh, why do we bother doing this? Why don't we just take interesting behavioral ideas and then apply them and see if they work? Um, so I'll share with you a quick example. Some of you have probably heard the classic behavioral example of organ donations. Have people heard about this example before? So different countries have different systems for signing people up for organ donation. The ones in the green here are countries where people are automatically enrolled to donate their organs unless people opt out. So if you, you don't need to sign up, you don't need to fill out a form, um, you only need to do that if you don't want to participate. The countries in black here along the bottom are countries where you actually have to opt in. So if I want to donate my organs, I have to go and fill out a form and hand it in. Um, so just making this simple design change of whether you have to fill out a form to opt in or opt out significantly changes um, the rates of organ donation in those countries. Um, and this is interesting because you would think that people's preferences were pretty pretty uh, consistent across these different countries. And yet this simple design feature actually reveals very different outcomes. The same has been found of retirement plans. So a lot of employers offer 401k plans. At some companies, people have to enroll in that plan by filling out very tedious forms and selecting their retirement allocation. Um, other firms, they're automatically enrolled unless they don't want to participate, in which case they have to fill out a form. So here in the orange here, you can see these are folks who are automatically enrolled. Pretty high uh, enrollment rates, around 80%. In the green here, these are folks who had to fill out a form to enroll. And I think it's interesting here that um, at first there's this huge gap. It does tend to narrow over time, um, but not completely. Even after four years, some folks still haven't bothered to fill out that form and enroll in retirement plans, even though we can assume they're pretty similar populations of people. So we know that defaults are, po are powerful. Um, forcing people to fill out a form to opt out of something can be a powerful design tool for nudging them into enrolling. Um, so why don't we use it in other settings? What about at tax time? Could we help people save some of their refund? Um, so a couple researchers wanted to try this out. Um, so they went to Vita sites, which are um, free tax preparation sites. And they said, well, what if we default people into saving 10% of their refund automatically? Will that help people save? So they found um, that for folks who had to opt in, Around 9% of folks said, OK, yes, I want to, to save 10% of my refund in savings bonds. Any guesses as to how much they found if people were forced to opt out? No guesses? 16? Exactly the same. It turned out it made no difference at all. Right? So compared that to the organ donation slide, where the default option was way higher enrollment rates, here it ended up being exactly the same. There was no effect on defaulting people into saving some of their money. So why is that? 
Um, well, they started digging into the surveys and asking people a little bit more about what their intentions were. So out of 100 employees in the workplace, around 68 said, oh, I know that I'm saving too little for my retirement. I'm aware of this. 24 of them said, I already plan to raise my savings rate in the next two months. I want to save more for retirement, and I'm going to do it soon. I'm going to get around to it. And yet only three actually followed through. So here you can see there's a big gap between all these people intending to save for retirement, but only very few actually following through and doing it. This is something we call the intention action gap, where I want to do something, but for some reason it's very hard to follow through. At tax time, it was a very different story. They asked people, why didn't you want to save some of your tax refund? Um, some of the reasons cited were not trusting the government. I didn't want to put my savings into bonds. Um, I wanted to be able to access that money. I'm not sure about the interest rates. But far and above, the biggest reason that people didn't save was because they already had planned how they were going to spend their refund. They didn't want to save that money. So here, there's not that intention action gap. People didn't intend to save. So defaulting them into saving was not effective because people just opted out. So it's instances like that um, where in behavioral science, we think it's worth digging into the context and trying to really understand what's going on before we implement solutions. Um, throwing a dart at the board is one way of testing behavioral innovations, but it can be very expensive um, if we're not sure um, what's going on. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the nudge. Um, I want to talk you guys through a real world project that we worked on. Um, again, this is one where we followed this methodology of understanding what's the problem, what's going on, what kind of design are we creating, and then is that design actually effective? Can we test our designs? Um, so in this case, we were working with a rural bank in the Philippines called Card Bank. Um, they had a lot of customers who were opening savings accounts, but weren't actually using those accounts over time. Um, so this was bad for the customers who seemed to intend to save and have a little bit of a savings cushion. Um, and it was bad for the bank because they had a lot of dormant accounts, which were very expensive to keep open. Um, and one thing we've learned in behavioral science when it comes to people's financial health is that it's often not that they don't know what they should be doing. Um, so a couple researchers looked at traditional financial education classes where they sit people down in a room like this um, and I would come in and teach you about your finances and tell you how you should be saving money. Um, a, a couple researchers reviewed more than 200 studies of programs like these and they found that yes, they do increase people's knowledge. People leave these courses with a better understanding of their financial lives, and yet they don't seem to result in basically any behavior change. Less than 1% of behavior change can be attributed to these classes. So this means that a lot of people um, might be learning what they want to do. They might even intend to save money or improve their financial lives, um, but it's not enough to just sit them down and tell them what they're doing. So instead, in this case, we knew it probably wasn't an information problem. There are probably these other behavioral factors going on that are getting in the way of people saving money. They open these accounts, they intend to save, so what's preventing them from following through? Um, one psychology I want to talk to you about today is something called present bias, where our desires in the present can often outweigh our longer term goals that we're working towards. Our preferences tend to shift whether we're thinking about our present selves or our future selves. Um, travel back in time with me for a moment. Were any of you alive when Blockbuster Video existed? Yeah, all right, got a few. So Blockbuster Video was uh, a brick and mortar version of Netflix where you would go in, you would browse um, trays of hundreds of video cassettes, uh, decide on a movie, take it home for a few days, return it eventually, probably get charged some fees for not returning it. 
Um, but a couple academics wanted to do a study at Blockbuster Video where they compared what do people say they want to watch in the future and then what do they actually end up watching in the present. Um, so they asked people a week in advance before they went to this video store, what do you think you're going to rent? Tell us, tell us what videos you're interested in watching. <laughs> then another group, they actually looked at what are they actually renting when they go into this store. <laughs> what they found was when they asked in advance, people cited highbrow movies like Schindler's List, like foreign films, like documentaries. When they actually went into the store to rent a movie, they more likely left with something very lowbrow, like comedies. Um, so I Married an Axe Murder is a Mike Myers classic, for those of you who haven't seen it. I highly recommend it. They found there's this huge shift between what I want in the future, theoretically, and what I actually end up doing in the present. Um, they've actually followed up on this study with Netflix, and they found the same principle holds. People put the highbrow movies in their queue, but when it comes time to watch a movie, they put on the lowbrow selection. Um, have any of you experienced this in your own queue? No one will admit to it. <laughs> <laughs> I know my queue is full of documentaries, you know, the latest French film, but in reality, I end up watching Property Brothers, so. So this is an example of present bias um, in terms of our choices about the future versus today. It also can show up when it comes to managing our own time. I've noticed this in myself over and over again, where a colleague asks me, can you come help with a project next September? It's a bit in the future. Oh, sure, yeah, no problem. I'm happy to help you out. September arrives, why did I say yes, right? I should have anticipated that my level of busyness is not going to change between today and September. Um, and in fact, I'm going to have exactly the same amount on my plate. And yes, I'm unable to anticipate that in advance. I always think the future will be a little less busy, a little bit easier. Then that time arrives and I regret my decision for my future self. And you see this again and again, where it's these small upfront costs that end up outweighing the longer term benefits. Um, and unfortunately, it means that we may not realize some of those benefits because we're deterred by the costs today. Um, take the example of financial aid. Uh, it should be a no brainer that if I'm gonna get thousands of dollars in financial aid, I should be willing to fill out the FAFSA today. But for those of you who have filled out the FAFSA, it's quite painful. It's longer than a tax return. It asks information like, what date were your parents married, um, which is very hard to come by. And they find that a lot of students either don't file FAFSA or file it late and miss out on financial aid opportunities as a result. Um, similarly, in order to have a healthy lifestyle, um, 15 productive years later should be worth five hours a week now. And yet, I still did not go to the gym this morning because it was kind of snowy and cold. It should be worth it, and yet those small costs get in the way. And in the example of saving, um, we know that we want financial security, particularly for retirement, um, and yet giving up the spending in order to save feels painful today. So I end up valuing my present self and my desires today over tomorrow. Um, so one solution to this problem um, is about something called construal and how vividly we think about the future. If we can make the future more vivid, we empathize with our future self more and prioritize our decisions for our future self. Um, so this is something that's actually been implemented by Merrill Lynch, where it helps you visualize your future self. You can put in a picture, and it'll actually show you what you'll look like at retirement. And they found that by sh showing you visually the future you, you're more inclined to save money for that future self. Um, and they've tested this in a lot of different ways, including writing a letter to yourself, anything to create that continuity between me today and me tomorrow. All right, another psychology I want to dig into with you guys um, that I think we can all relate to is self-control um, around controlling our impulses and resisting temptation and the amount of effort that that actually takes. Um, not just physical effort, but actually cognitive effort. Um, so much, some of you may have heard of the marshmallow test before. Yeah? We're going to show a quick video. I'm 
Okay, sit in that chair. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you two, another one, so then you'll have two. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? okay. All right. I'm gonna go do something and then I'll come back. It smells yummy. Oh, it smells really good. So it's up to you. You can have it now or you can wait. Okay? I'll be back. Stay in the chair, okay? Okay. All right, so I'm gonna leave and then I'll come back, okay? So you can either eat it right now or you can wait, either way, okay? Okay. How'd you do? Did you do good? You did? Yeah. You wanted to eat it, didn't you? Yeah, so did I tell you to give you another one? Okay, now you can have both. You need them. <laughs> All right. So that's a classic study. Um, the original study they did many years ago, and they actually did a longitudinal study, so they followed the children throughout their lives. Uh, and they found that the children who were able to resist the temptation of the marshmallow ended up having better long-term life outcomes um, than the children who were not, una not able to resist the marshmallow. Any thoughts on what strategies the kids used that were successful or not successful in resisting? Did you notice anything in the videos? Self-distraction. Self-distraction. So an interesting feature of this experiment is that they made the room where the kids are not have any toys or games in it on purpose because when they put toys or games in the room, the kids were actually very good at distracting themselves and they would just play happily until the next marshmallow arrived. So you'll notice that a lot of the kids distracted themselves and the ones who got closer to the marshmallow and were smelling <laughs> the marshmallow had a harder time resisting that temptation. So that's one tactic of self-control, is actually called self-regulation, where you remove the need to resist the temptation completely, um, either by putting it somewhere else or by locking it up. Um, here's a great example. Um, again, the going to the gym example in the morning. We often set the alarm at night, um, hopeful that tomorrow we'll be energetic and ready to bounce out of bed. Um, that often doesn't happen. We may end up hitting the snooze. Luckily, there's a product you can buy called Clocky. Has anyone tried Clocky before? <coughs> yeah? What happens? Um, you wake up, chase it, and then after you chase it, you 
Exactly. So the clock key bounces, it makes horrible high pitched squealing noises. It bounces off your nightstand and rolls around the room until you actually grab it and turn it off. So it forces you to get out of bed. This is what we would call a commitment device um, because it forces you um, to follow through on your behavior. I had to stop using Clocky because the noises were so annoying and I often caught it before it rolled off, so it didn't even really get me out of bed. Luckily, they make a more advanced version now on your phone where in order to disable the alarm, you actually have to solve a puzzle. So you don't just have to get out of bed, um, you actually have to engage mentally with this puzzle. Um, and I guarantee you are fully awake by the time you finish the puzzle. I tried it. Yeah. Oh, would you? Again, these are only effective if you can't cheat, right? <laughs> it's very easy to cheat. Um, so commitment devices can take a lot of different forms. Um, this is something called a kitchen safe, where you can lock up a temptation good for a specified amount of time. Um, that might be delicious treats, cigarettes. If you're on your phone too much, you might want to lock that up. Um, in our work with consumers, we find that people have very ingenious ways of developing commitment devices for themselves. Um, we've heard a lot of stories about people taking credit cards and freezing them inside a glass of water so that by the time it thaws, they've rethought their purchasing decision. Um, we've heard about people giving credit cards to a friend or family member so they feel bad about going to ask for it. People not activating a credit card so that they can't use it at the moment that they want to use it. So a lot of consumers are actually very self-aware about their self-control and at times are good at designing around it, um, provided that they don't have a good way of cheating. Uh, and then a final psychology I want to talk to you about is actually something more about the context than it is about a psychological principle. And um, that's something called scarcity and it's about what it means to live in a context of scarce resources, whether that's scarce money, scarce time, um, or other resources, and how that affects our cognitive bandwidth. Uh, so there was a sort of interesting natural study to think about the effects of scarcity among sugarcane farmers in India. Um, so this was two of our founders wanted to see how do people's decision making change when they are in a period of abundance where they have abundant resources versus a moment when they have scarce resources. Um, Sugarcane farmers were a great environment to study this because before the harvest they have very few resources. After the harvest they all of a sudden have an abundance of wealth compared to that initial time period. So what they did was they studied these farmers. They had them do quick cognitive aptitude tests. So you can think of it as something similar to an IQ test um, where you, for instance, have to rotate different shapes or read words aloud quickly. And they had these farmers take those tests before the harvest and after the harvest. Um, and they found that the same farmers performed very differently when they were in a different context. They performed much worse before the harvest than after the harvest. And they thought, well, this must have something to do um, with the amount of resources that they have and the effect that actually has on our brains. Lest you think um, that that doesn't apply in the US, you can think of it as two suitcases. Um, so someone who has an abundance of resources, you can liken to someone with a large suitcase. Someone with scarce resources has a much smaller suitcase. If I'm packing for a trip and I have a large suitcase, I can fit almost everything I need in there. I don't have to make trade-offs. I can probably put in a few different pairs of shoes. I can bring all the outfits I need for each occasion on my trip. If I have a much smaller suitcase, I start to have to make trade-off decisions, right? I have to weigh the value of this pair of shoes versus that pair of shoes. I have to not bring a hair dryer. I have to start very carefully calculating everything that I need. And the same thing happens when we're in a situation of scarcity. We start having to make trade-off decisions. You can think of it in terms of financial trade-offs about if I only have $50 this week to spend, how am I going to prioritize what I spend it on? I will need to know the price of local goods. I'll need to carefully weigh whether it's more valuable to pay my electricity bill first or to buy food. Um, and the problem is that making these mental trade-offs actually consumes a lot of mental bandwidth. 
So it's not just the time it takes to make those decisions, but it actually occupies us mentally. Um, in a, a mall in New Jersey, um, our founders did another study where they brought shoppers aside. They measured their income levels, so they had a sense of whether they were in a condition with scarce resources or abundant resources. Um, and they asked them to consider two different situations. So one group, they said, okay, imagine your car breaks down. It's gonna cost you around $300 to get it fixed. Your auto insurance will, will cover half of it. So you need to figure out how am I gonna cover the rest of that $300 cost? Um, for most people, that $300 cost was fairly um, easy to cover. So they call this the easy financial scenario to think about. Another group, they gave a hard financial scenario to think about. Your car breaks down, it's, gonna, it's expensive, it's gonna be $3,000. Your auto insurance will cover half of it, but you still have $1,500 to have to cover. How are you going to cover that cost? After they gave them these scenarios to think about, they had them take those cognitive aptitude tests again to see how they performed. Again, these are just hypothetical scenarios. They're not actually real world scenarios. And they found something really interesting. Um, so in the condition with the $300 service, easy scenario, people with above median income and below median income performed about the same. You can see the gray bar here, right? On those cognitive aptitude tests, they did exactly the same performance. But when they were thinking about that hard financial scenario, the folks who were below median income performed worse. And this tells us something about just thinking about a hypothetical financially stressful situation actually changes the way our brains work because it occupies that mental bandwidth once they start thinking about how would I cover this expense. Um, and just to frame this in terms of what does that actually mean in terms of the impact on someone's IQ, um, that's worse than losing a whole night's sleep. It's the same equivalent. So that context of financial stress and financial strain actually occupies um, that mental bandwidth in a really damaging way. And this leads to a principle we call tunneling, where when <laughs> folks are in a situation where they're scrambling to cover their expenses, um, they are so focused on putting out fires and making those trade-off decisions that it's really hard for them to engage in long-term planning because they're so occupied with the present. So in the, going back to the context of the Philippines, um, these are the three principles that we found when we started interviewing the staff members, interviewing the clients, um, observing the customers when they went in to open these accounts, visiting the customers' homes and talking with them. First, we found that, again, those savings goals felt pretty distant and abstract relative to their spending needs. I need to spend money today on these things that are vivid and concrete. My savings, I know I need to save, but it feels very vague and distant and off in the future. Secondly, we found that planning to save and resisting the, temp the spending temptation in order to save occupied people's mental bandwidth. It requires cognitive effort to force yourself not to spend and to save that money. And third, we found that people were often tunneling on those immediate needs. These were folks that had a little bit of extra income, um, but th they were still tunneling on, what, what do I need to do today? So what we ended up designing was creating a moment for them to think about how much they want to save. So at the moment of opening an account, they were already sitting down with their account representative for that savings account. So we had them just fill out a very quick plan where they designated what's your savings goal and how much do you need to save to get there. So first we had very vivid pictures. So drawing upon that principle of visualizing myself in the future, we wanted to include a visual element where we showed exactly what the different goals are that people are selecting. We also had them break down their goal into concrete steps. So rather than saying, I want to save $10,000, how much do you actually need to save each month, each week, each day to get there? Um, making that more concrete and making sure that it's practical um, can help people realize those goals. We also incorporated a commitment element where in the presence of my account representative, 
I am going to sign my name. Um, there are some interesting studies that show that if you have someone sign the top of a form rather than the bottom, they're more likely to be honest in their uh, responses on that form, um, perhaps because of the order with which we fill out the form. So we wanted to make sure people were committing to save, uh, even though the account representative wouldn't do anything if they didn't follow through. There's still a little bit of that social accountability. We also designed a savings calendar because we knew that local uh, shops often gave out calendars and people frequently used them in their homes. So we knew that if we distributed this calendar, people were likely to use it. Um, and we tried to include uh, a way to reinforce the progress that people were making by having them add up how much they were saving each day, each week, to see that that actually adds up to something at the end of the month. Um, this combats something in behavioral science we call the peanuts problem, where we tend to discount the amount that we have when it's very small amounts. Um, we don't realize how much that is cumulatively. So this gave people a way to think through how much are you saving in total and reinforcing that they were making progress. Finally, we had a series of email and text message reminders about their goal. So reminding them, you made this goal, um, this is how much progress you've made um, as sort of a way to capture attention along the way and make sure um, they were remembering those intentions that they had set. So we tested this. Um, we did a randomized control trial where we randomly assigned people to either go through this goal setting exercise or not. Um, and we found that it did have a statistically significant effect on people's financial outcomes. So folks who use these tools and materials and receive their reminders had 15% higher initial deposits when they started using the account. They were more likely to initiate a savings transaction. And finally, they had 37% higher balances at the end of the testing period. Um, the CEO told us that those higher balances persisted, but we haven't seen the data, so I can't verify that. Yeah? When was the testing for this? This was, uh, I think it was four months total. Um, and we wanted to do sort of longer term follow up, but our data collection practices fell through, unfortunately. Um, we're actually in the process of scaling this up. Um, at a larger bank in the Philippines. So hopefully we'll have more data to share so we can see over a longer time period um, how it af affects people's finances. All right, um, so just a couple final thoughts um, and then I know we wanna have some discussions. So this is an example of a nudge um, where we change this element of the choice architecture to help people follow through on an intention we think they have. Um, and it's really, it can be really powerful, but it's often at an isolated moment in their lives. Um, and when you think about the scarcity issue, uh, even something like that that helps me save a little bit more over time doesn't mean that it's completely um, giving me a more abundant set of resources, which leads us to think, are there deeper solutions out there? Are there ways to intervene other than at these specific moments to help people save? You can think of it in terms of rather than giving you a better way to pack your suitcase, can we actually help enlarge your suitcase so that you have slack? and you have an abundance of mental bandwidth to devote to other things. Um, one area that's received a lot of attention is unconditional cash transfers. Is anyone familiar with the cash transfer world? Yeah. Um, so the original incarnation of this was conditional cash transfers, where I'd say, I'm gonna give you money for a specific purpose, say education, or for buying fertilizer for your crops. And then I'm going to check later on to see if you used it for that purpose. A couple researchers thought, well, do we really need those conditions? Can we trust people to use this money in, um, in a productive way that enriches their lives? Do we actually need to spend a bunch of money going and auditing and making sure that we know how they used it? So this led to the development of unconditional cash transfers, um, which are sometimes designated for a purpose, sometimes they will be for education or for crops, um, but no one's checking up to make sure that it was used in that specific way. Um, I think we can think of cash transfers as a way of creating slack. When I have this extra pot of money to draw upon, when I have just a little bit extra, um, it can ease that mental bandwidth problem um, and help me um, relax and attend to all of the things in my life that I need to be paying attention to. 
but there's also a psychological aspect to it. Um, and some psychologists have thought, OK, so one way of, of tackling this scarcity problem is actually just giving people more resources. Are there any psychological ways of helping people regenerate mental bandwidth when we can't give them the resources? Um, and one tactic is around these emotional effects of poverty and a tactic called affirmations. Um, so one of our affiliates did a study where they went into a soup kitchen and they brought aside one group of patrons and at the beginning, before they served the meal, they asked them either verbally or in written form to write or talk about a moment in their lives when they've been successful. So they were priming them to think about a moment that they've been powerful and effective in their lives. Um, they found that that group was more likely to take up job training literature than the group that was not asked um, to think about that. And I think this gets to the larger emotional effects of poverty is that it can be demotivating. Um, and by doing simple psychological exercises like these self-affirmations can rejuvenate people's mindsets for a period of time um, and help them have a little bit of extra mental bandwidth. So this principle has been tested in education. Um, they've had at-risk students do affirmation exercises in a number of research studies um, to show that, yes, it does motivate students um, and can help them, for example, take up tutoring services or be more motivated to follow through on the goals that they set within their schoolwork. Um, so again, this is just showing the results of the folks who um, were, did that affirmation exercise versus folks who did not. I'll pause there um, and see if there are discussion topics or questions I can answer. Any questions? Any questions? <coughs> Yeah. Yeah, we're in the process of scaling, I guess, two other projects in addition to that one. Um, one is something called rules of thumb or heuristics, where um, it, this was originally done with entrepreneurs in Latin America, um, and where they realized that a lot of the um, small business management skills were being taught in a way that weren't actionable. So bringing for example, women who owned small businesses and worked in the marketplace and gave them accounting training was less effective than giving them very simple, actionable rules of thumb that they could implement in their daily lives. So for example, um, you should keep your, have one pocket in your apron for your personal cash and one pocket for your business cash. That's a very actionable way of teaching about separation of personal cash flows and business cash flows. Um, so we tested that sort of rules of thumb based training versus accounting training and found that it had positive impact on the revenue that they generated, presumably because it helped them actually track their cash flows more effectively over the month. Um, that's something we're scaling up with text messages and phone calls. Um, we tried an initial version with phone calls where people could, they would, they would get a phone call um, and it would share, it was like a, recorded message of someone sharing a rule of thumb that they could implement around their business. But they found that people just started hanging up after like 15 seconds. Um, so it had no impact. No one stayed on the line. Um, so we've tweaked that and we're testing a couple versions. One is a text message version and one is um, where it's sort of local people talking it, it, almost in like a soap opera environment and like sharing stories about what they do to make it a little bit more engaging and less of like a boring, <laughs> a boring tip over the phone. So that's one where we're scaling up. Another model we're scaling up is what we call the financial health check, um, where instead of people being told what they should do with their financial lives, they sit down with a financial coach or talk with a financial coach over the phone, set some goals, and then actually implement a recurring savings transfer or a recurring debt payment over time. So they don't have to do anything after that coaching session. So that's another one that we're scaling up and looking at, could we do a digital version of it? Um, and how much does it cost banks and credit unions to offer something like that? I feel like a lot of even really good projects don't go past the, that first Oh yeah. Do you feel like Most projects fail, to be, <laughs> to be clear. Do you feel like 
Philip, you guys have some insights as to what enables you to take things towards scale? Um, I mean, I think first being rigorous in evaluation and being willing to acknowledge that something failed um, and say this is not worth scaling has enabled us to put, <coughs> get motivation and resources behind the things we think are worth scaling. Um, and then partners are always the key, is having good partners who can implement something well. Like a, a cool idea is great, um, implementation is always the hardest part. So finding those partners and making sure that we have a really strong interaction with them has been key. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about the um, financial, the tools which you give to people. So I'm thinking yeah. about the motivation to save. Mm -hmm. So how do, you, um, how do you deal with like motivation in the first time when somebody is doing this for the first time as compared to like over a long period of time? And how do you measure success in these two ways? I mean, the first no. uh, first interaction is going to be maybe positive, but then how does it follow through? That's a great question. Um, and I think in our previous work around savings, we found that our interventions are usually more effective for people who haven't saved before than people who have. And that might just be a quirk of the data because people who have tried to save and failed at saving are less likely to succeed in the future, right? Um, but I do think that there's something around when someone is trying something for the first time, it's a reset moment. And in fact, there's been a lot of studies around something called the fresh start effect, um, where if you can leverage someone in that moment where they're almost starting a new mental account about something, whether that's um, their New Year's resolution or the start of the week on Monday, um, people are often more motivated and likely to follow through in those moments than they are um, in the previous moment. So I do think there's something around timing that's very important there. Um, but I also think that it's that long-term engagement afterwards. So for example, we didn't have them just fill out their goal setting forms and then go home and track it on their calendars. We also had those reminders to capture their attention. Um, obviously reminders, can fade over time, especially when we get more and more text messages each day. Um, but we've tried some tactics where we have people compose their own reminders rather than having sort of institutional reminders. And that's been more effective is when people can shape their own language for themselves and actually choose the timing that they want to receive it. Um, that's been more effective at helping people follow through. Other questions or thoughts? Yep. Um, yeah. yeah, that's a great question. That's a little bit why we create this diagnosis process, so that we outline what our assumptions are. And then when we go out into the field, we actually try to disconfirm it. So I say, my assumption is that people are forgetting to save. So I want to go out into the field and talk to people and look for instances where people are remembering. So I can say, oh, actually, it wasn't forgetting at all. They remembered that they wanted to save. They just remembered after their payday. So it was too late to actually put that savings away. Um, so we do try to be really strategic about figuring out what the assumptions are and then testing them. But it's always a problem because humans tend to look for information that confirms what we already think um, and ignore information that doesn't. So it does require forcing yourself to think carefully about it, for sure. And we try to make our observations to be more about the context rather than the person. Um, so in the savings example, we looked for, are there visu visual reminders in the home about savings? We found that there weren't. So that's why we created a calendar, is because we thought, what is it about this context that is shaping people's behavior? And what can we change about the context without making assumptions about their motivations or their character or their conviction? Yeah, great question. Oh, I think there was one back here. I think I missed out so far. Uh, when you talk about the unconditional uh, do donation. Oh, the cash transfers? Yeah. Mm -hmm. did, did that work? Yeah, so there's been a few different evaluations. Um, so far, they do look positive, but there's some contradictory findings. 
Um, there is a more recent study that found that unconditional cash transfers do improve people's economic um, outcomes, but also their stated emotional well-being. So they say that they're better off as a result of these funds. Um, but as with all research, I'm sure p other people will disprove it. <laughs> So it's something to continue looking as researchers build that base of evidence um, and figure out what's the best way to deliver it. Um, we've already found in our cash transfer work that the way the messaging about the disbursement and the timing really matter. So I think there's a lot to figure out in terms of if you're just giving people a bunch of money, <laughs> what's the best way to do it? Yeah. Oh, I think you had one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my question is about uh, the behavior science. So, if we look for the science, like, uh, do you guys have the thought like, uh, uh, under the same constraint, could have a different like uh, country or different uh, side of the world, like uh, the Philippine case? Yeah. Would that happen in China or India under the same constraint? Because yep. if I thought in the science, that means if the constraint is the same and we can give the same result. Yeah, I think knowing the specific context is really important. That includes the culture, that includes uh, you know, people's housing, that includes the way they interact with family members and with people in the community. So I do think that the context really matters. And I think that's why we can't, for example, take these goal tracking tools that we created um, and spread them around the world and expect that they'll have the same impact everywhere. I think that you always need to have a solid understanding of why something works in one context to be able to translate it effectively to another. So I bet there are certainly commonalities. I think in the savings world, we see a lot of repeated patterns in different countries. Um, but yeah, I think you do absolutely need to understand that context before you design effectively for it. Yeah. So I'm thinking about um, like connecting data and monitoring these interventions. Yep. So uh, how do you like, deal with the challenge of uh, when when you ask people about saving, there is a certain kind of picture they want to project about themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that is one challenge. And yep. the other one is um, the intangible like feelings around saving. So mm -hmm. how have you encountered this and how have you Yeah. Those are very good questions. And that's one reason why we don't just rely on interviews or observations. Um, we try to look at the underlying data to see what are people actually doing. Um, so I think there are two ways we address that. One is by when we do interview people, we ask what questions and how questions rather than why questions. So if you ask someone why they do something, they'll always give you an answer but it may or may not reflect their own internal decision-making processes, which are often really complex. We often don't have insight into why we do something, or we're afraid about how someone will perceive us, so we'll give a different reason than we actually experienced. So instead of asking someone, why didn't you save this month, we'll ask them, well, tell me about when, you, when you've saved before. Tell me about what you're going to do in the future. And that can often unearth um, very different responses than if you start asking people to explain why they do things. Um, and then another thing is just looking at that administrative data and seeing where do we actually see the drop off? Um, how are people actually engaging with the, these accounts and how does that match what our hypotheses are about what we think is going on? Um, and observations are another great tool for seeing what actually happens when people interact with this bank account form. Um, what about if I try it? Can I fill it out? Is it easy to fill out? Uh, so I think the more we can engage with the user experience um, and not ask them to hypothesize about it, the better uh, the answers are. Other questions? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> when working with um, nonprofits or foundations, um, as an organization who acknowledges failure, how do you, um, how do you, I guess, work in within the context of a foundation or a nonprofit that wants an actual outcome? Like yep. How do you deal with those? I think it's really hard, especially because a lot of efforts in the nonprofit space don't have a testing component. So everything is a success if you're not testing it, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I think one way is we run a lot of tests at the same time. So we'll do a portfolio of projects around, for example, college completion. 
and we'll test a bunch of different things, knowing that a lot of them, or most of them, are probably going to fail. Um, so that's one way that we still have something to report to the foundation, um, but we've you know, explored a lot of different areas and been rigorous in our approach. Um, yeah, it's hard, it's hard um, to know how to communicate that, especially because even if you do that and you report it to the funder and you share it with the partner, very few people want to read a story about things that fail. Um, there's a great book that just came out by a, one of our affiliates named Dean Carlin um, called Failing in the Field that talks about this problem and how everyone wants to share success stories, no one wants to talk about their failures, um, but it's a big gap in the research world. So it's a struggle. My question was about uh, testing and yeah. how, how does your testing change with different contexts or does do your randomized control trials remain the same or how do they vary in various they definitely change based on the context um, because they're delivered in different ways. We have different sample size, so we may be able to test more aspects of an intervention or fewer aspects if we have a smaller sample. Um, so we definitely adapt them. In some settings, we come across a partner who doesn't have a big enough sample size, so we have to do um, a more we can do a pre-post test, look at outcomes before and after and compare them, which isn't as rigorous, but sometimes it's all you can look at. Um, we work with a lot of partners who just do basic A-B testing, which you can do in a really rigorous way of testing two versions of an email and seeing how they compare. Um, so there are quasi-experimental methods, we would call them, um, to get around those hurdles sometimes, but they're not always ideal. Sometimes you have to make do with what you can do. Question, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm interested about what you were mentioning about affirmation solutions for free and mental bandwidth. Yeah. And especially in education. Mm -hmm. Do you have any sources that? Yeah, the researcher is Jeff Cohen, G E O F F C O H E N, if you want to look up some of his studies. Um, he's the, the main person that I know of. Um, the woman who ran the soup kitchen study was Crystal Hall. Um, but I don't think she's done any in the education sphere. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my perception is that it can be difficult to get donors to give money um, to somebody who isn't saying at the outset what they think the product is going to be. Um, that is correct. Uh, do you guys have a strategy for that? Or it something that's worked? Because you are running what in the development sector would often be termed as rigorous slash expensive um, research. Yep. And not a lot of people are going on. Yep. And I think you're exactly right, is that if you don't know what the design is, it's much less appealing because it's vivid and I don't know what you're gonna do with our money, right, from a funder perspective. It is very challenging. Um, we have good relationships with some major foundations who understand our methodology and are willing to make that bet. Um, but with folks who don't know us very well, it is a really hard sell because you're selling an approach, not an idea. But yeah. Don't have like a connectification Yeah. I mean, I think having a track record that you can show of here are I used this methodology. Here are the three positive results that I did produce can help generate buy-in. Um, other than that, having vivid examples and drawing upon the research world where similar approaches have been effective. Um, yeah, yeah, it's tough. Yeah, all, right. all right, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, can we do one last exercise? Oh, sure. I have a pop quiz for you guys. <laughs> See how you do. <laughs> Final challenge. <laughs> all right, so this is a letter that they sent out to customers from a South African bank these folks had been pre-approved for a loan um, and they sent out, they had a unique opportunity where they had thousands of customers and they said, well, let's just vary as many different things as we can and see which ones are effective. 
So this is not what we recommend to do in the field. <laughs> But it was a unique opportunity to test a bunch of behavioral things at once. So what they tested was, first they put a nice picture of a friendly person um, at the bottom of the letter. They had the gender match the gender of the person they were sending it to. Next they tried matching the race of the photo uh, to the person that they sent it to. Another group, they tried putting a female photo on it, nice looking woman. Another group, they tried having a cell phone raffle. Um, if you take up this loan, um, we'll enter you into a raffle to win a free cell phone. Another group, they actually um, shortened the amount of loans that you could choose from. So instead of giving this table that gives, what is that, a total of 12 different loan options, they only gave one option, single option. Another group, they had, we speak your language into a variety of different South African languages. Another group, they had a comparison to a competitor rate. So they translated their loan terms into, this is much better than what you would get at the other bank. Uh, then another group, they listed potential loan uses. Imagine you can use this to buy a car, invest in your home, etc. Any guesses about which of these were most effective or least effective? Most, let's start with most effective. Competitor rate, why? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you feel like you're getting a better deal? Yeah. Why? Because then it's less of a decision that you have to make, so it's less Right. So there's a principle called choice overload or choice conflict, where a number of options or complex options are hard to sift through. Huh? What else? H. Yeah. H. H. Listing yeah. potential loan uses. Why? The abstract number mm. into concrete. It makes it more vivid. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good guess. Any others? I said A. A. Matching gender. Why? Because um, you keep, can tend to see yourself mm -hmm. um, either to identify with it. Mm -hmm. What do you think did the worst? The raffle. <laughs> raffle? No one likes the raffle? I want the raffle. I mean, yeah, but it's like one in the other. <laughs> Anything else we don't think is going to do well? Uh, we speak your language? Okay. Any other guesses before we see the results? All right, so these are really interesting. And they tell you why you need to test things. <laughs> the most effective thing was the photo of a female. <laughs> Single most effective. <laughs> but only for males, so go figure. The second most effective was the single choice of loan terms. Good guess. It eliminated choice conflict. It gave you just one option to imagine yourself taking up. Listing potential loan uses actually didn't do well, which is very surprising, right? Um, so one piece of speculation from the authors about why that might not have worked is something called goal inhibition, where if you give someone a single option or example to think about, it's harder to think about other ones. So it's possible that by giving you a loan use that didn't relate to you anchors your thinking on a car or investing in your home and doesn't make you think about all the other loan uses you might actually want to, to use it for. But yeah, <laughs> humans are funny. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you guys. This has been great. Um, and I'll stick around for a couple minutes if anyone wants to come.